this lecture, I'd like to talk about archaeology at a scale that's bigger than household archaeology or the archaeology of settlements, namely archaeology that's at the scale of whole landscapes or the space outside of settlements. Archaeology at the landscape scale involves a wide range of topics, only some of which you see in this slide. They include agricultural practices, urban hinterland relationships, transportation routes, military defenses, mortuary practices, and even ideology and cosmology. And since one of the things that interests archaeologists is to understand ancient social arrangements, it's important to keep in mind that different kinds of societies make use of landscapes in different ways. For example, for mobile hunter-gatherer bands, we would expect to find campsites scattered through the landscape. And we might expect at least some of those campsites to have something to do with resource extraction. For tribal societies, we might expect to see farmsteads, villages, and nomad camps. While chiefdoms might have central sites, with a settlement hierarchy of smaller settlements that are subservient to that center. And early states usually have urbanism with pronounced settlement hierarchy, city hinterland economies, and pronounced territoriality. All of these have repercussions for what archaeologists could expect to find in landscapes. For those mobile hunter-gatherer bands, for example, we would expect to find places or attractive spots on the landscape, hunting stands, kill sites, butchering sites, and storage caches. For tribal societies, we might find field huts, mortuary sites, or storage caches. And for chiefdoms, we might expect to find field huts, terraces, field systems, mortuary sites, forts, and monuments of various kinds. For early state societies, we might expect to find field systems, roads or hollowways, terraces, canals, forts, possibly caravanserai, temples, and monuments. While some of these things can also occur in settlements, quite a few of them only occur outside of settlements. In this lecture, I plan to concentrate on the following topics. What are landscapes? Archaeological survey as one of the main tools that we use to investigate landscapes. Settlement pattern studies. Economic uses of landscapes. Cosmology of landscapes. Geoarchaeology and GIS, also important tools in landscape archaeology. The term landscape itself has a rather interesting history. It actually comes from art history and originally referred to paintings and other kinds of art that showed pastoral scenes with happy peasants conducting various kinds of agricultural tasks in rather idealized settings with trees and cattle and sheep and so on. Over time, it's come into much more general usage so that nowadays it refers to things like gardening and in archaeology refers to pretty much anything that occurs at the scale of regions rather than within settlements. One of the most critical tools in landscape archaeology is archaeological survey. This is the set of methods that archaeologists use in order to find phenomena on the landscape or in the landscape uh, that can tell us something about what ancient people were doing there. In this lecture, I'll briefly introduce some of the archaeological survey methods, talk a bit about how we characterize the targets of survey, which might be, for example, archaeological sites, and I'll also briefly introduce concepts having to do with the factors that affect the results of surveys, some of which are under our control and others are not. Of the methods that archaeologists use to conduct surveys, one of the most important remains field walking. This involves basically walking around the landscape, preferably over plowed surfaces, and looking at the ground to try to find artifacts that might be signs of past human activity. Some of the other methods that we use increasingly include aerial or satellite imagery and drone survey. And where artifacts and other evidence of past activity are not visible on the modern surface, sometimes we have to use shovel testing or coring or geophysical prospection in order to determine whether or not there's something underneath the ground. No matter which method we use to conduct an archaeological survey, it's really important to consider what the goals of the survey are when we're designing that survey. Some surveys involve inspecting only a small sample of the region of interest. This is okay when our goal is to get a kind of general idea 
or characterize the archaeological resources of a region. In other words, to try to get an idea of whether or not certain kinds of sites are, might be common or rare in the region, or what kind of state they might be in, in terms of preservation. Sometimes a survey is part of a heritage management plan. For example, if someone's building a housing development, it's important to survey the area that would be impacted by that development in order to find out whether or not it would destroy important or significant archaeological resources. In cases like that, it's important to try as hard as possible not to miss any significant remains. In still other cases, our goal might be to search for some rare type of site or sites uh, that are very difficult to find, in which case we have to expend our resources very carefully in a way that makes it highly likely that we will find such sites. In still other cases, we might be interested in detecting spatial structure among sites in a landscape. In cases like this, we're looking for patterns in the distribution and relationships among the sites, which means it's important for us to have a very thorough survey of a contiguous area so that we don't miss any of the sites that might be related to one another. Searching for rare sites is one of the things that's accomplished by use of purposive survey, which is the term that archaeologists use for survey that's targeted specifically instead of having kind of a shotgun approach. It's particularly useful whenever we have a very specific target in mind, such as a shipwreck that we know is out there somewhere, but we just don't know its exact location. In such cases, we can even use operations research. This involves a set of techniques that was developed during the Second World War in the search for German U-boats, but it's nowadays used mainly for search and rescue. But it can also be used for petroleum exploration and even archaeological searches. What these applications have in common is that we're searching for a very specific target, whether that be an oil field or a sunken ship or an historic fort. As I mentioned before, field walking remains one of the most important field methods in landscape archaeology, and that's partly because of its relatively low cost. It works best where vegetation is very sparse or where the fields have already been plowed to churn up any artifacts that might lie a short distance below the modern surface. But in many cases, overlying sediment or vegetation makes it impossible to find anything by simply field walking. In such cases, we might use more obtrusive methods, such as shovel testing, which involves digging small holes in the ground to see if there are any artifacts lying below the surface. Or by using coring or augering to do much the same thing. The trouble with coring and augering is the hole is much smaller, making it much less likely that you're going to intersect artifacts. There's also an array of geophysical methods that archaeologists can use. These can detect certain kinds of buried materials, but only when those materials contrast strongly with their environment. For example, most of these methods would detect an iron cannonball buried in the ground, and some of them would detect a buried stone wall or an elongated buried ditch, but none of them would be likely to detect a cluster of potsherds or stone tools. And even if they could, they wouldn't be able to tell you what kinds of tools those were or what they dated to. These methods also tend to be slower and more costly than field walking as well, so that usually archaeologists only employ them in places where they're already pretty sure that there is a site, and they're just trying to understand better uh, what the character of that site might be and where might be a good place to excavate. Aerial imagery has been a really important tool in landscape archaeology since at least about 1920, and nowadays it's heavily supplemented by satellite imagery. We can learn a lot by studying imagery like this and then ground truth it by making field visits to corroborate any identifications we've tentatively made. And we're not limited to imagery that's in visible light spectrum. A really important modern tool is LIDAR, which is a type of radar scanning that allows us to recognize microtopography on the ground even where there's heavy vegetation because vegetation is transparent to radar. This method has been particularly successful at identifying ancient settlements in rainforests. All of these methods are vulnerable to an array of factors that affect their success at detecting things. One such factor is the properties of the target and whether or not those properties contrast with their environment. 
Another is the type of signal that communicates information about that target uh, to some kind of detector, which could be a human eyes. Another is the medium of signal propagation, whether that's through soil or through the air. And one that's under our own control is the type of sensor or method of inspection that we use in order to detect these signals. And finally, we have our ability to recognize a signal and correctly identify it. The way we organize our survey also has an important impact on the results. Consequently, it's important to make sure that we design the survey in a way that helps us meet our goals. Among the things we have to decide, besides selecting our method, is the shape of the units that we use in conducting the survey and how we distribute those units over space. This is called the distribution of survey effort. Archaeologists can survey using various shapes of observation unit, including points for things like shovel tests and cores, transects, which are long, narrow strips that we survey, especially in field walking, quadrats, which are usually rectangular polygons on, on the map, and uh, landforms, which are more natural units, such as hilltops and valleys and terraces along valleys. Often, archaeologists have used geometrical kinds of arrangements, such as ones you see here, that could be either random, stratified, or systematic in their distribution, and consist of points, lines, or quadrats. In some cases, archaeologists use a more natural type of survey unit, such as a landform, or uh, the boundaries of an agricultural field, but then they subsample within that by long, narrow strips or by points. In the case you see here, the irregular landform is sampled by equally spaced transects. In this case, the archaeologists use pre-existing agricultural fields as units and walk transects down the middle of the fields. And in this case, the archaeologists took the existing fields as a sampling frame and sampled at one point in the middle of each field. Even when we survey by transects, those transects do not have to be parallel and oriented in the same direction. In the case you see here, where somebody is interested in finding artifacts in the area around a major site, they have a radial arrangement of transects. And they can either walk along those transects as part of field walking, or they can sample at points along the transect and, for example, collect all the artifacts within a five square meter area. And there are a variety of ways that we can execute these transects as well. They can all be parallel, but in alternating directions. And when we do resurvey of the same unit, it's actually optimal for the second set of uh, transects to be at a diagonal to the first set. Some of the specific factors that can affect the results of a survey are the ones you see listed here. They include choice of method, the survey design in the sense of the distribution and shape of units as just discussed, the abilities of the surveyor or the detector that they use, visibility, which has to do with how much the artifacts on the ground might be obscured, for example, and target obtrusiveness, which has to do with those properties that are inherent in the target that we're trying to survey for. We can also express the thoroughness of survey using a measure called sweep width. You might imagine a scenario where we walk down a transect line and find all the artifacts within a certain distance of that line, let's say two meters, and none outside that width. You might call that the region of clean sweep. Kind of like if you pushed a broom along and found all the artifacts that were encountered by the broom. In reality, it's more realistic to think we'd find more artifacts closer to our transect line and fewer the farther we get away from it. Effective sweep width, which you see here, is the region within which the number of artifacts we miss is equal to the number of artifacts we find outside that width. In other words, they cancel out. In this image, the black dots represent artifacts we found and the white ones, ones we missed. This clearly has implications for how closely spaced the surveyor should be while field walking. If the spacing between them is approximately equal to the sweep width, you might expect them to find pretty much all of the artifacts, although that's not strictly true.
If their spacing is twice the sweep width, you might expect they'd find about half the artifacts. And if they're quite widely spaced, as you see here, you could expect it to go to miss an awful lot of material. All of those factors I mentioned earlier affect the value of the sweep width. For example, in this case here, the fact that there are olive trees in between the transects would probably have some impact on the size of the sweep width. In other words, it would be smaller than it would be had those trees not been there. Having at least rough estimates of our sweep widths clearly has implications for how widely spaced our surveyors should be. In other words, it has a role in our decisions about our survey intensity or the spacing between surveyors. And it also has a role in helping us evaluate our survey's thoroughness so that afterwards we can tell people that we've probably discovered a certain percentage of the artifacts or sites in a region. The question is, how can we figure out what our sweep widths are? As far as I'm aware, the only effective way to estimate sweep widths is by calibration surveys. In other words, we seed a field with artifacts in known locations, and we have surveyors survey it multiple times and calculate the sweep widths on the basis of their results. In other words, we see how often they were successful at detecting artifacts at different distances away from the transect line. This will vary according to all kinds of factors, including what artifact type it is and what kind of vegetation cover there might be. It's somewhat time consuming, but I think it's worthwhile. In the next part of this lecture, I want to talk about settlement pattern research. This involves looking for spatial structure in the distribution of archaeological remains over some region and depends on having a very thoroughly researched region. In other words, a place where there have been multiple archaeological surveys that have uncovered most, if not all, of the important archaeological remains. In other words, we can't do this kind of research on the basis of some small sample of the space. Archaeologists borrowed the methods for this kind of research mainly from geography. Some of this research includes statistical and other kinds of analyses to see if sites cluster in particular parts of the region, perhaps for economic reasons, whether there are trends over large chunks of space in things like the likelihood of finding certain kinds of artifacts, and whether there are relationships among the sites in the landscape that might indicate things like settlement hierarchies. Clustered distributions are ones that are just clumped up like you see here. They contrast with random distributions in which there's no spatial structure at all. And they also contrast with even distributions. When we have sufficiently complete information, we can measure the distances between the sites and use a method called nearest neighbor analysis to determine whether the distribution is clustered, random, or even. In short, in cluster distributions, the average distance from each site to its nearest neighbor will be relatively short, while in even distributions, it will be relatively large. The main obstacle to using this method in archaeology is it quite often happens that we don't have complete enough information to be sure that we can always identify the nearest neighbor of each site. Trend surface analysis is a type of regression analysis, but it's in three dimensions instead of two dimensions. While ordinary regression fits a line to a series of dots, this involves fitting a surface, kind of like a flexible rubber sheet that bends to fit as closely as possible a series of dots that are floating in space. In the case of archaeology, those dots might represent the percentage of a pottery type, for example, found at a series of sites across the landscape. Often what's most interesting here is not the trend surface itself, but the differences between those individual dots and that surface. These are called residuals, and they can either be above or below the surface, and large residuals might indicate that something interesting is going on. For example, there may be some sites that have unusually high or unusually low percentages of some artifact type. This might happen, for example, when a site was the center for manufacture or distribution of that artifact type. One example of an application of this method comes from an article by Hodder and Reese in 1977. 
They fitted trend surfaces to distributions of Roman coins in the Western Empire at various points in time over several centuries. In the example you see here, black circles represent positive residuals and white circles are negative residuals. You can see large positive residuals at some of the major seaports, no doubt related to their importance in maritime trade, but you also see large positive residuals along the German frontier, where many Roman troops would have been stationed and would have required pay packets. Rank size analysis is a method that archaeologists have used in order to detect whether or not settlement systems had hierarchy in them. It's based on the observation that in modern urban countries, the second largest city is about half the size of the largest city, the third largest city is about a third that size, the fourth largest city is about a quarter that size, and so on. This relationship is called Zipf's rule. And if you graph it with the cities ranked from largest to smallest along the x-axis and a logarithmic scale of their population size on the y-axis, usually you end up with something that looks like a straight line. We can do this for archaeological settlement sites as well, using site area instead of population size as the size factor. When we do that, we often find a relationship that departs from a straight line. And archaeologists have described these departures as the convex pattern, the primate pattern, and the primoconvex pattern. And they've attempted to relate these departures from Zipf's rule to variations in the way settlement systems were structured in ancient societies. For example, the convex pattern might result when you have several competing large cities or towns in the same region that are of roughly similar size. But in primate distributions, you have one enormous settlement that dominates hundreds of very small settlements with almost no settlements in between. This is what we find, for example, in the case of the ancient Mesopotamian city of Ur during the beginnings of urbanism. However, problems with our sample can also affect the shapes of these distributions. Most notably, most archaeological distributions show a steep falloff at the lower right end of the distribution. Almost certainly, this results from archaeological surveys' failure to detect a lot of the small size sites. So they're missing from the sample, and this disturbs the rank order in that part of the curve. Rank size analysis can, however, be our first clue to the possibility that there's a hierarchy in the settlement system. In modern urban and some kinds of ancient settlement systems, this can lead to a settlement hierarchy that has a hexagonal structure. This kind of spatial structure is called a crystallarian lattice, and it's part of central place theory. It describes a situation where each major center, such as a city, is surrounded by six smaller centers, each in turn surrounded by six smaller settlements still. This tends to result in hexagonal arrangements, just as soap bubbles tend to approach hexagons when they're closely packed together. In highly urbanized settlement systems, the hexagonal structure can become quite complex, with small hexagons embedded within larger ones. The exact nature of this structure depends on a variety of economic, social, and political factors, with some of the influence being access to services, transport costs, and a degree of control by the center. But it's important to keep in mind that these crystallarian lattices are an idealized model, usually with the assumption that the settlement system occupies a featureless flat plane. But even on relatively flat planes, a variety of geographic and other factors can distort the lattice so it's not exactly hexagonal. Here, for example, you see municipal boundaries in southern Germany, a relatively flat area, that was the inspiration for Chris Stoller's work. Although there is some hexagonal structure here, it's a very distorted hexagonal structure at best. However, you can see a relatively concentric structure around some of the major cities, as here. But not all settlement structure is hexagonal or lattice-like. One notable exception is frontier networks, which are particularly pronounced in coastal regions where some foreigners or colonizers establish trading posts to exchange goods with indigenous people further inland. A classic example of this is the fur trade network of North America. European fur traders established bases on the coast or on the edges of major rivers and lakes 
and they and their indigenous trading partners used canoes and river networks to reach settlements and other trading posts farther inland. Both the physicality of the river networks and the nature of the trade itself tended to result in very tree-like networks, rather than crystalline patterns. Under optimal conditions, there's a method that archaeologists can use to reconstruct the boundaries between major centers. In other words, to infer what their territories might have been. And this involves creation of something called Thiessen polygons. In the simplest version of Thiessen polygons, we simply assume that the boundary between any two centers is halfway between them, and that the line segment representing that boundary is perpendicular to a line that extends from one center to the other. In another version of Thiessen polygons, the boundary between two centers of unequal size shifts in favor of the larger center. Drawing such boundaries often results in a pattern that looks kind of hexagonal. But with distortions due to topography and for other reasons. Another way that archaeologists analyze regional settlement patterns is to look for relationships between settlement locations and various kinds of land use possibilities. For example, they can see how the sites relate to such things as differences in geology or soil type that might be relevant to things like agricultural production. And this can be the first step in trying to understand how rural economies worked, especially in agricultural societies. In medieval Europe, for example, there'd be a castle or a manor that belonged to a noble family that ostensibly owned all the land in the neighborhood, as well as a mill and a village that housed the serfs that worked the land around the manor house. Some of that land was also used for pasture and woodlots. One of the tools that archaeologists used for finding associations between archaeological site locations and various environmental factors is called GIS, or Geographic Information Science. It involves using digitized maps that occupy different layers in the GIS. Typically, one layer is a digital terrain model that represents the topography. Another layer might show soil types, and another one, bedrock geology. Still more layers could include agricultural potential or hydrology. And the layers of greatest archaeological interest would be the ones that show site distributions, perhaps with different layers for different time periods. We can also use a layer in the GIS to represent the artifact densities from an archaeological survey. In this case, large circles indicate high densities of artifacts and smaller circles, lower densities. Not only can the GIS help us find associations between archaeological site locations and various environmental factors, it can help us do all kinds of other things. Among these, it can help us find the most likely route between any two sites, something called a least cost path. It can also identify what are called buffers, for example, showing all places on the map that are within 200 meters of a river or stream. Archaeologists often use GIS to identify viewsheds. What this means is that the map shows all places that are visible from a particular point in space. This can be particularly important for sites that have a probable military purpose or a purpose related to ideology or cosmology. But it's important to take into account how tree cover that's no longer there may have affected viewsheds of the past. GIS is also important in heritage management because it can help us build predictive models that allow us to identify hot spots or areas of high probability of containing certain kinds of archaeological resources. This can help us design archaeological surveys optimized to find those kinds of archaeological materials, or it can be used to help us make development decisions. For example, we might decide to avoid building a new subdivision in one of these hot spots, and instead zone it for recreational use. In Europe, there's a long history of archaeological investigations of the field systems that surrounded and supported these agricultural communities in ancient and medieval times. From about 1920 onward, aerial photography greatly aided this kind of research. Under the right conditions, and with the raking light of early morning or late afternoon, it's possible to see very small differences in topography that can reveal uh, ancient field boundaries. These can result from intentional terracing, but even from the long-term consequences of plowing fields with a moldboard plow 
and a team of oxen. Generally, ancient and medieval farmers tended to divide their lands into fields that could be worked by a team of oxen in one day. And in the 1920s and 30s, archaeologists classified different kinds of field systems, including Celtic fields that they thought were associated with the Iron Age, and other kinds of fields that they associated with Roman occupation or medieval times. These classifications are based mainly on the shapes of the fields, but we can also work out their relative chronology. For example, this ridge and furrow field extends down into the gully, indicating that the gully is older in date. And adjacent ridge and furrow clearly is avoiding some architectural structures that are there, indicating that those structures are older. Meanwhile, other walls and fields cross-cut the ridge and furrow, indicating no regard for its presence and a later date for those features. In some parts of the world, we can also find traces of ancient water management systems in the form of canals and barrages and dams. Particularly in arid regions, such systems greatly expanded the opportunities for agriculture. One of the features of major floodplains, like those in Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley, are that the stream is actually above the level of the plain. This results from the repeated accumulation of sediment on the banks of the river whenever it overflows, building up raised areas called levees. The simplest kind of irrigation simply involved breaking holes through those levees so that some of the river water could flow through onto the lower floodplains beyond. But in places like Mesopotamia, people also built extensive canal systems that allowed them to direct the water toward precisely those fields that needed watering. And as you can imagine, this would have involved a certain level of communal decision making, or even state controlled management of the canal systems. Water could be directed to particular fields simply by blocking or unblocking the junctures between various branch canals. Our evidence for ancient canals sometimes comes from ancient art, but that's relatively rare. More often, it comes from aerial photography and satellite imagery. Not only can we see linear patterns in the distribution of the sites, because settlements would have to be located close to water sources, we can often see physical traces of the canals themselves. For example, excavating the canals involve throwing the excavated dirt along the sides, creating spoil banks. And even after thousands of years of erosion and plowing, there are slight topographic differences between the spoil banks and the center of the canal that can be detected in various kinds of imagery. Archaeologists have invested quite a bit of research into this in Iraq, where we can also estimate the dates of the canals on the basis of the dates of the sites along their routes. In principle, we can get more direct evidence for their date by excavating down to the silts accumulated at the bottom of the canal. In some regions, instead of finding canals, we find other kinds of water management systems. For example, in the Negev of southern Israel, ancient farmers built dams or barrages perpendicular to the course of the wadis that were draining the surrounding hills. These impeded the runoff from the scarce rainfall, allowing the water to soak into the ground. But water management systems are not unique to the Middle East. There is also extensive evidence for canals in the Phoenix area of Arizona. These canals supported extensive agriculture in the Salt River Basin from about 300 BC to about 1450 AD. Archaeologists can also sometimes find evidence for ancient routes and roads. Again, we can sometimes see traces of roads in aerial and satellite imagery. But when there are well-built roads, such as Roman roads, we can often find traces of them while walking on the ground as well. The one you see here, for example, is part of the Via Nova that followed the eastern fringes of the Roman Empire in Jordan. But archaeologists have found examples of roads that are far older than Roman roads. For example, this wooden trackway in the Netherlands dates to around 2500 BC, a date that's easy to determine on the basis of the dates of the logs used in its construction. Other physical features that show us ancient roots are called hollow ways.
These are roots that are much lower than the surrounding agricultural fields that result from centuries of repeated traffic by humans and animals. The traffic erodes the surface of the root while also throwing up dust that eventually settles on the sides of the root, eventually creating tall ridges on either side. While archaeologists first identified these features in Europe, they also occur in the Middle East. Here, for example, the satellite imagery clearly shows the roots of hollowways extending outward from an ancient city in northern Iraq. Hollowways often radiate outward from ancient settlements because they were the routes by which farmers would reach their fields. But some of them also mark the routes between ancient settlements. Using some combination of the methods I've discussed earlier in this video, as well as some others, Archaeologists are often interested in studying the social interactions among groups who occupied a region. As noted in this slide, some of the indirect measures or proxies that we can use to do this include the presence or absence of imported artifacts, the proportions of specific exchange goods, such as obsidian, from the same source, the proportions of goods from varying sources, the directional dominance of the flow of goods, the number of categories of goods exchanged, and the kinds of categories of goods exchanged. You'll note that all of these proxies have to do with the exchange of trade goods. But trade is only one kind of social interaction, and in any event, I'm going to discuss trade in another video. For many decades, archaeologists have also assumed that some characteristics of ancient artifacts could tell us something about interchange of ideas, such as concepts about how to make a pot or how to decorate it. This is related to what archaeologists nowadays call communities of practice, a topic that I'll deal with in a different video. But for now, I'll just mention how archaeologists have applied a method called social network analysis to try to identify interactions among settlements and figure out which ones were more closely involved with one another. One area where there's been a lot of research of this kind has been in southern Ontario and northern New York State where using attributes of the decoration on the highly decorated rims of Iroquoian pots allows us to measure similarities and differences among pottery assemblages. The more similar the sets of attributes between any two sites, the more we'd expect them to have interacted. When we combine all this information into a single social network analysis, the most similar sites will clump together, indicating a high degree of social interaction among them. We can also identify highly influential sites that appear to have a large number of connections with many other sites, as well as some peripheral sites that appear to be somewhat isolated. Archaeologists have also applied network analysis to maritime networks among Minoan sites in the Aegean region of Greece and Turkey. Landscape archaeology isn't only about settlement patterns or exchange relationships among people. There is in fact a very long tradition of archaeologists investigating the sacred and cosmological aspects of landscapes. This began in Europe, where the modern landscape is dotted with all kinds of sites and monuments that are most likely cosmological or ideological in character. In addition to barrows and standing stones, in many parts of the world we also find geoglyphs. These are large figures of animals, geometric shapes, and so on that can only be viewed from above. The most famous of these geoglyphs are the Nazca lines found in the Pampa Colorada of southern Peru. These extend over an area of some 500 square kilometers and consist of geometric shapes like spirals and lines as well as figurative art like depictions of monkeys and birds. They were made by selectively removing the dark colored pebbles on the surface of the ground revealing the lighter colored pebbles underneath. And despite what some ancient aliens enthusiasts might say, these bear no resemblance at all to runways. The area around Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain in southern England provides an excellent example of what was likely a sacred landscape. Stonehenge did not exist in isolation, but is surrounded by a series of other monuments, as well as a long formal avenue that was likely used for processions of some kind. Some of the monuments in Stonehenge's neighborhood are mortuary sites, and these mortuary sites are visible from Stonehenge. 
highly visible mortuary landscapes are a feature in many parts of the world. In some places, including North America, these might consist of a series of burial mounds on the hills and ridges that are visible from settlements in the plain below. In many parts of the Old World, as in this example from Jordan, we find what are called dolmen fields. These are large areas, sometimes tens of kilometers long, that contain hundreds of dolmens. These consist of several upright stone slabs with another stone slab serving as a capstone. In excavated examples, there are burials underneath them, and they seem to be associated mainly with the early part of the Early Bronze Age. Rock art can also be associated with sacred or ideological landscapes. Although there can be many reasons for creating rock art, and it's not always associated with ritual or religion, in many cases it probably was, or at least with spirituality. In some parts of the world, including Australia, rock art tends to be associated with areas that have wide vistas or panoramic views, and this is where GIS's view shed capability can come in handy. But in other cases, rock art can occur in dark and potentially mysterious places, such as narrow canyons. Some archaeologists have attempted to capture the emotional aspects of things like cosmological landscapes by employing a theoretical approach called phenomenology. However, it's important to keep in mind that how we might feel about a landscape that we walk around today might be very different from the feelings that one would get a thousand or two thousand years ago, in part because the physical landscape has changed so much since then. And this is just one of many reasons that we also have to pay attention to geological aspects of landscapes. Geology and geomorphology can tell us a lot about how landscapes have changed over time. And this has impacts on our understanding of ancient landscapes as well as on our ability to find traces of those landscapes archaeologically. For example, in what are called karstic landscapes, in places like southern China and Vietnam, thousands or even millions of years of erosion through the limestone bedrock has created a very rugged landscape of limestone mountains separated by narrow valleys. If we wanted to search for cave sites that might contain Paleolithic remains in such a landscape, we would want to search in the upper parts of these limestone mountains, because the lower parts of the mountains and the valley floors did not exist in the Paleolithic period. In other examples from Southwest Asia, tectonic processes that caused the Jordan Valley to sink over time has caused the streams and valleys that drain into the Jordan Valley to become deeper and deeper over time, although there are also times when those bodies accumulate sediments, usually because there is a body of water in the Jordan Valley, such as Lake Lasan. But when the lake begins to dry up, this lowers the base drainage level and the wadis begin to incise themselves into the bedrock once again. Terraces along the edge of these wadis represent portions of the old valley floor at various stages in its history. Paleolithic sites can only occur on the upper terraces or in caves just above them, while the lowest terraces can only contain relatively recent archaeological sites. Rising and falling sea levels can have similar impacts on archaeological distributions. In this example from a river that drains into the Pacific Ocean in British Columbia, the various terraces have very different ages. And since sites would normally occur near the riverbank, sites on those terraces also belong to different eras. Similarly, on the Pacific coast itself, there are stranded beach lines that pertain to times when sea level was higher relative to the land. In part, this results from postglacial isostatic rebound. That's when the land rises relative to the sea because it no longer has the weight of glaciers pressing it down. So-called badlands in arid regions present a situation similar to karstic topographies in places like southern China. Here, too, erosion has removed large parts of ancient landscape surfaces, stranding them on the tops or middle portions of features that are sometimes called buttes. Meanwhile, we're not going to find any very ancient remains in the valleys between these buttes unless they've been washed down there by erosion. The only places where we'll find very ancient remains are in the buttes, 
and we can assume that many archaeological remains have been removed by erosion over time. Meanwhile, on relatively flat alluvial plains, the main problem for archaeologists is not erosion, but accumulation of sediments, especially alluvial sediments. Deltaic formations can build up where streams and rivers drain into the alluvial plain, and the river itself tends to meander and change course frequently. And during floods, when the river overflows its banks, it deposits sediment on the sides of the river, which builds up eventually to form levees. Over thousands of years, many archaeological sites can be completely buried under alluvium, making them almost impossible for archaeologists to find. Another place where accumulation of sediment is a problem for archaeologists is Aeolian environments, such as sandy deserts. In these areas, shifting sand dunes can fairly rapidly cover over archaeological sites. Just as the sand dune you see in this picture is fairly rapidly engulfing a relatively recent mud brick house. In such areas, the only places we're going to find archaeological remains are in the valleys between the sand dunes where we may also find oases like this one that would have attracted settlement in the past. However, since the sand dunes move over time, we can also expect that the oases would sometimes move. Accurate understanding of settlement patterns in a region like this really requires the active collaboration of a geologist or geomorphologist. Some of the most dramatic landscape changes occurred in the aftermath of the Ice Age. For example, in northeastern North America, the retreat of the glaciers allowed the release of water through the newly exposed St. Lawrence River. This allowed the water levels in Lake Iroquois to drop, eventually becoming Lake Ontario, and this lower lake no longer drained into the Hudson River. We would expect late Pleistocene and early Holocene sites to cluster along the shorelines of old Lake Iroquois. And obviously none of these sites could occur in areas that were formerly glaciated or under the water. The melting of millions of cubic kilometers of glacial ice also caused sea levels to rise. And in the early part of the Holocene, the rising sea levels engulfed Neolithic villages that were on the coast. Archaeologists have investigated several such villages in the Haifa region of Israel. These submerged villages show abundant and sometimes well-preserved remains of houses, water wells, and even cemeteries with large, well-constructed cyst graves made from large stone slabs. In what is now the North Sea, between the United Kingdom and Netherlands and Denmark, there's an entire submerged landscape with abundant remains of the hunter-gatherers who once lived there. And along some portions of the west coast of North America, wherever isostatic rebound didn't compensate for it, it's likely that rising sea levels engulf some of the campsites of the earliest immigrants into North America from Asia. Surveys of the seabed off the East Coast sometimes retrieve artifacts that could date to the Pleistocene period. To summarize, it's important for archaeologists to conduct research at the scale of whole landscapes because we can't expect ancient human beings to live their lives only in nice, tight little bundles that we call archaeological sites. Many of their activities occurred outside these settlements or between settlements. And we'd also like to understand the relationships among these settlements. Furthermore, many of the sites are not settlements at all, and we'd also like to understand the relationship between them and the settlements. For agricultural societies, we can often even study the exact form of their agricultural field systems, as well as the routes between the settlements and those fields. Archaeologists have a number of tools in order to accomplish this, but one of the key ones is at the data collection stage where the major tool is archaeological survey. There are many kinds of archaeological survey, but one of the key methods still to this day is field walking, which simply involves walking across the ground and examining it for artifacts and other traces of human activity. Recording and analyzing these kinds of traces provides us with the evidence we need in order to understand such things as settlement systems, territoriality, rural land use, and even ideological beliefs. At the same time, we need to be acutely aware of the changes to the physical environment that may have occurred since ancient times. In many cases, 
these geological processes have altered the distributions of archaeological remains in ways that could be quite misleading. However, close attention to those geological processes can help us interpret the traces that remain more accurately, and they can even help us design archaeological surveys that are more likely to be effective.